I've never been so confused about a camera in all my life. The Sigma FP, let's get into it. So the Sigma FP, I mean, we've all known about this camera for a long time now, and some people love it, some people hate it. There's some great reviews and there's some not so great reviews. So I've been talking to a few people about this camera for, yeah, for the last year. I like to try different cameras, you know, all the cameras that you've probably seen on my channel and the ones that you haven't. Like, I mean, I've been testing a Sony a7R4 and it's a great camera. The autofocus, the image coming out of it, everything is absolutely great. I, I love the camera. Not something I would buy, but it was great. And then the GH6 as well, you know, another great, offering from Panasonic. Again, not my cup of tea, but I wouldn't have known that unless I tried them. Because we've all got different uses, it's hard just to say, yeah, oh, okay, yeah, this camera's amazing, it does this, 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 I recommend it, you go and buy it now. It's hard. And this is kind of the, the, the situation where I found myself with the Sigma FP. So I've kind of dismissed it because, you know, some of the reviews weren't favorable, but then Justin Phillips made that video and it was absolutely amazing. The delivery on that video was absolutely flawless. I even commented on it and um, said that, it, you know, it really piqued my interest on this camera. So started looking around to buy one, found one for 1,200. I put in an offer for 1,000 pounds. The guy rejected my offer and sent me a counter offer for 1,100. And I thought, you know what? Let me buy it. But then something said to me, no, 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 not yet, not yet. Just, you need to try it first. So thankfully around this time, my friend Roly, he's um, who I met in the ESM group, he had just bought one. So I said to him, can we meet up so I can try it, you know, because I would like to buy it and I, but I wanna see what it's like first. So he said, yeah, yeah, no problem. It, it, you know, come and we'll meet up down in London and you know, we'll do a few test shoots and, and it'll be cool. So that's what we did. So we went down to London and you know, hooked up the cameras and yeah, everything was going well. What I first noticed immediately on, on holding the camera that it was just absolutely amazing. The build quality of that camera is absolutely beautiful. Loved it. Holding that piece of metal in your hand, well constructed, nice clear screen, buttons, everything just look really nice and compact. It looks really nice, I, I'm not gonna lie. Build quality is absolutely amazing. Going through the menus was good as well. I don't think it was that bad. I mean, you have to kind of cycle through a lot just to get to certain places, but it wasn't too bad. And looking through the, the specs, you know, we've got the usual stuff like, it's a 4K RAW shooter that shoots CDNG. So that's probably the best RAW you can get. So it's proper RAW. You're not talking about some compressed flavor. You're talking proper RAW. So the amount of detail that this is gonna capture is absolutely amazing. And it, and it did, and it captured a lot of crispy, nice data. It was really nice. But then you've got other options as well going down to you know 8-bit and sometimes I do shoot 8-bit as you would know because I have an Olympus and I've used 8-bit on paid work as well because of the file sizes the Olympus does really well in, uh, in for, you know, for certain circumstances and I love it. So I've got no problem with 8-bit but I do like to shoot raw. And looking at other things, just like connecting it up to a mobile phone and having a mobile phone as a monitor through a cable, it's just an amazing experience in my opinion. You know, it's, it's just nice. It gives you so much more options. There wasn't hardly any lag in that transmission either. So that was fantastic as well. So at the moment, yeah, it's ticking all the boxes. Like I'm thinking, you know what? I could possibly, you know, get rid of my cameras and actually get a couple of these and I'll be good. Small if, if I want to take it around town and for personal projects and I can rig it up big if I want to for paid work. So all looking good. So when I captured this footage, I didn't capture anything that was gonna look beautiful. Like I'm not interested in like, you know, taking pictures in the meadows and you know, of old castles or whatever. This was a fact finding mission. And what I was interested in was the quality of the raw that it was recording. So obviously, you know, from that full frame sensor, how good is it? Is it gonna be, is it looking crispy? Is it gonna give me more than what I got already? And then secondly, I wanted to know how malleable is that footage? Can I manipulate that in, in a really, you know, harsh way, you know, pull, uh, see the latitude, you know, if I underexpose or overexpose. And then thirdly, it was about the 8-bit as well. So I wanted to see how the 8-bit functions because, you know, CDNG can get really big. When I used to shoot on a Blackmagic OG, I ended up swapping it for the micro because of the micro did compressed three to one raw. So it was much easier to record higher frame rates and, you know, with smaller file sizes. That's what I loved about the micro. But this one, you haven't really got those options. So I really need to see, you know, what the situation was. So in the first shot it was amazing. We've got a very contrasty scene here, you know, this blown out sky and we've got all of these shadow details and everything else. Full frame is looking good. I've got a lot in view, even on a 50mm lens here, the Canon 50mm, and it's looking amazing. 
So the first thing I tried to do was pull back the highlights and yeah, the highlights came back no problem at all. Absolutely amazing. I tested this in, in various ISOs as well, you know, from 100, 800. We didn't really need to go that high because you know, it was a, it was a, it was an overcast day, and you know, so we didn't really need to go really high. Uh, put, tried it with an ND filter as well, and absolutely everything was amazing, absolutely flawless. So the first test was a definite pass. And then I went on to things like skin tones. Uh, so I wanted to test it with white skin and black skin. Again, these are really quick corrections, nothing crazy, nothing set up properly. I just wanted to see what could be adjusted, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, and on white skin and black skin, I think it looks absolutely perfect. It was very easy to get it to a point where it looks uh, acceptable. And that's, and again, another pass is <laughs> turning out really well. So then I wanted to try the latitude. So but in this scene here, I underexposed it. So I wanted to crush the blacks and see what I could pull back from the blacks and then, you know, put a bit of noise reduction and see how well that would work out. And yeah, absolutely flawless. It worked out great. I think it pulled back a lot of, a lot of detail. And yeah, it introduced a bit of noise, but with a little bit of noise reduction, no problems at all. Absolutely perfect. So I'm happy, I'm happy at this moment. So then we moved on a bit and then I uh, tried to do a few different things. So I wanted to test the 8-bit as well because as I said, I do shoot 8-bit for paid work. So I did want to test that. And if I don't want to shoot CDNG RAW or I just want to shoot 8-bit, I want to see how good that looks. So this is kind of where I ran into my first problem is because the screen is so small that I kind of misfocus on this one a bit. So that's my bad on that one. But then it's not the first time it's happened to me when I'm using cameras with a small screen. So I moved to a different spot, uh, focused a bit closer on these people coming down the stairs and yeah, look absolutely amazing. I think the details there, I could still bring, you know, certain details back. You know, the sky was pretty much blown out anyway because it started to get really overcast by that time. But yeah, I'm happy with this image. It was no problem. And then this is when I started to notice things that were quite interesting. So when I brought the Olympus into the mix and I shot the same scene with the same lens, on the white concrete, you can see that the Olympus in flat mode has tried to clean up all of those marks whilst the Sigma has left it there. But I also noticed that the Sigma has a lot of aliasing on the steps in 4K H.264. Okay, right, so everything is great at the moment. You know, everything is running fine, no problems at all. So I thought, let me compare this to the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema camera. So the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema camera, I was shooting 4K DCI at three to one. So the least compression, it's a very high quality file that is, and you can use that for all things like green screen, VFX, all that kind of stuff. But I must say that I never shoot in three to one because I've never needed to. So when you shoot three to one, five to one, eight to one, there's not much difference unless you start pixel peeping and stuff like that. So I normally shoot, you know, at eight to one, uh, sometimes even 12 to one, or even ProRes Proxy because the images that are coming out of the, uh, the Blackmagic, they're absolutely amazing. So I shot the same scenes, and it was in three to one, and I thought I'd try the, uh, you know, the recovery. And again, in the Blackmagic, no problem in, in the recovery. Now, bear in mind that the Blackmagic is shooting compressed raw. Braw is compressed raw, but I had no problems bringing back as much detail as I did as in, within CDNG. Now, what Blackmagic have done with the raw codec, and a lot of people sniff at this, but you can't sniff at the, the feet, what they've done. This is a magnificent feat that they've compressed this file, this raw, and you can still change your ISO, your white balance, highlight recovery, you still have all of that in there. Now, whether you're shooting three to one, five to one, eight to one, whatever, you've still got all of that 12-bit goodness to pull back from. With the Sigma, that's not possible. I've only got the option to shoot CDNG or to shoot in a H.264 flavor. There's no middle ground here. This is what I'm trying to say, that if I was to take my Black Magic and I wanted to shoot eight to one, I could take this 256 gig memory card and I could shoot for hours on it at eight to one, 12 to one, whatever. With the Sigma FP, if I wanted to shoot 12 bit, the same as what I'm doing on the, on the Blackmagic CDNG 4K, two terabytes is not even gonna get me that much. Because when I check the file sizes, the Sigma FP file size is bigger than what 4K three to one DCI is on the Blackmagic that I can't work with that. That's something I can't work with. So when I look at the specs and you, you look at, you know, the amazingness of CDNG and the color and this and this and the other, there's no point in giving that to me or trying to sell me on all of those mad specs if I can't use it because I'll just be sweating all day unless I'm turning up with like five, six terabytes of, of uh, uh, storage to record my footage onto. 
So then I've done the, um, you know, the, the skin test, the black and the, uh, you know, black and the white. And yeah, again, it's the same sort of thing. The qualities, you know, both on par with each other. They both look nice. Even when I'm using a speed booster, the Sigma was still obviously bigger, but that's okay. I'm all right with that. I'll just put on a wider lens or, you know, deal with it. That's the way it is. So what I want to say though first before I go into this is that the Sigma FP is a great camera, it's amazing. I think it all comes down to, you know, who you are and what you shoot for. Now the guy who purchased this, Roly, he does a lot of uh, shows, like proper shows with proper artists, music shows at concerts, events, all that kind of stuff. And he also uses the camera to, you know, on family days out or when he's traveling abroad to certain shows and stuff like that. So at the moment, he's not shooting Cinema DNG. He's just shooting normal uh, codecs in, uh, on the SD card. And it works well for him. And I was thinking that if you're going to go out to the park or, you know, on holidays and you want to shoot a little 10 seconds here and 10 seconds there, absolutely fine. No problem. I think the camera will work amazing for you. And, you know, there's a lot of latitude. You can pull back a lot of detail that it's already capturing, which we've already seen, in, even in 8-bit. So I think that it could work really well for you. But I think for someone like me that is a person that does weddings, talking heads, music videos, films, corporate, uh, promos. There's so much different stuff that I record that I just don't think the Sigma FP would work for me. Using the Blackmagic, I can go with the Blackmagic with a couple of SD cards, 750 gig, a terabyte at max, and I can go and shoot a whole day, no problem, with getting great footage. With the Sigma FP, that's not gonna be possible. Absolutely not gonna be possible. That kind of stopped me buying the Sigma FP dead in its tracks because that's not workable for me. Now, as I said, it's a great camera. It's an amazing camera, but the convenience is just not there. So to get the Sigma in the space of the Black Magic in terms of a screen, we'd need to add either a video assist or an Atomos Ninja. That would allow us to have a five inch screen and we called Braw, uh, raw or whatever but then we're still looking at a lot of extra money and then we also have to take into consideration more storage so again we're kind of kind of creating problems where there isn't any i know the black magic also still needs a battery to work that's fine but at least we can just put a battery and then you've got a five inch screen multiple codecs that can be recorded to sd card and we've got no problems here the only real benefit then is going to be full frame versus M43 and do you want to get a speed booster or do you want to shoot native micro four thirds? So when I spoke to people about this as well, most people were talking about, yeah, if you want to, you know, store the files, you can just use SlimRaw. But storing the files is a problem, yes, but that's not the main problem. The main problem is recording them in the first place. That I'm going to have to spend a couple of hundred pounds, 250 pounds or so, on maybe a two terabyte uh, NVMe, and I'm probably gonna need a few of those as well, just to get through a day. Now, if it turns out that's gonna be a really long shoot, what do I do if I start running out of storage space? With the Black Magic, I can just drop it down to 25 frames per second, and I can just throw in a normal SanDisk Extreme, and I can start shooting again. I've got no problems there, but with the Sigma, you don't really get those options. Everything is on par, if you ask me. Reco det detail recovery, sharpness, everything else is on par. But with the Black Magic, yes, you might have to get yourself an external battery or, or, or etc. You're probably gonna have to do that with the Sigma as well. But with the Black Magic, you can shoot on SD cards. You've got this massive five inch screen on the back. So if you're gonna hook it up to a gimbal or something like that, you, can, you, you, know, you can easily see your focus without having to get another monitor like you probably would need to do on the Sigma for critical work, you know, for the Sigma for critical work. So my conclusion is the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K is still so much more versatile. There's still so much more you can do with it. You can shoot ProRes, you can shoot uh, Braw, and you know, you can shoot all different flavors on an SD card, on an external SSD, on a CFast card. You've got so many options to choose whatever you want to do. And yeah, for me, I think that's the reason why I'm going to stick with the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K and probably leave the Sigma FP on the shelf. So before we end this, I just want to talk about Sigma and a new update. So it's fantastic that they're still updating the camera. And I think it's beautiful that they're adding so many more features. And especially I like the fact that they've added false color now, which would help with, you know, exposing correctly. I think the one thing that would make me switch from this camera and that would have made this a totally different video is if they added compression raw compression. If they added some sort of raw compression, that would just open everything up and I could literally shoot anything I wanted to. And then I probably honestly would have bought two of these cameras to then go and do my work on, no problem. Raw compression, they really need to add that.
So that's it guys, that's the end of the video. I do wanna give Justin props for that video and I wish he would've just left the black magic part out of it because he kind of really sold the specs on the FP and he was 100% correct. There's nothing wrong in what he said. Absolutely amazing. But when he said that the black magic was out, it's, I'm sorry, but it goes a lot deeper than that. It goes a lot deeper than that. If it was a case of just because it's got higher specs, then I would go out and buy a Ferrari right now because I was thinking, you know, that it's going to serve me better. But it's not going to do what I need it to do. In fact, it's probably going to hinder me even more. So there's more to it than just the specs on paper. How does it fit your current workflow? But, you know, Justin, thank you for that video, man. That was probably one of the best videos I've seen on YouTube on, on a long time. And, you know, you, you deserve applause for that, man. So well done, brother. Thank you for that video. It's just not for me. But take care, guys. I'll see you on the next one. Later.